Welcome to Hope Awakens. I appreciate you joining me. I'm in the George Vanderman studio at It Is Written in Collegedale, Tennessee, just outside Chattanooga, where today it was another beautiful day. You're joining people from around the world. And I want to greet Lindell, who is in Centerville, Ohio. Heather is in Walla Walla, Washington. Paul and his family are joining us from Chehalis, Washington. Janice is in Bismarck, North Dakota, right on Interstate 94. Danny is in Palmer, Alaska. Joe's in Toronto, Canada. Anna is in Mount Monganui in the beautiful Bay of Plenty in New Zealand. Kia ora, Anna. Vanessa is in Guyana. Bree is next to the Androscoggin River in Auburn in southwestern Maine. I am glad you are here. Thanks for being part of Hope Awakens. I'm John Bradshaw, and this is Hope Awakens, presented by It Is Written. I want to thank the many people whose prayers and generous financial support have made Hope Awakens possible. We simply wouldn't be here without you. Thank you so much. Now, Esperanza en Jesus is happening right now at EsperanzaEnJesus.com. I would love it if you would tell others about this outstanding series presented by my good friend, Robert Costa. Now, tomorrow night... I'm going to tell you what we are going to be doing next after Hope Awakens. You are going to love it. I'm thrilled. You want to tell others. If you've been enjoying Hope Awakens, I've got some more really good news for you. Uh, well, okay, this is not the good part. These Hope Awakens presentations will be coming to an end soon. In fact, this weekend. But your Hope Awakens experience doesn't have to end because we are starting up Hope Awakens Communities all across North America. These are virtual online communities, places where you can get together with others to pray, talk about what you've learned during Hope Awakens and to continue to study God's Word. We don't want this to end when it ends. In fact, when we end, we're just getting started. People from your part of the country will be meeting online to continue to grow in their walk with Jesus. Now to join a Hope Awakens community, Go to hopeawakens.org, click the Hope Awakens Community tab, and we'll connect you with the nearest Hope Awakens Community group. That's your nearest one. Now, tonight's free offer. Allow me to grab this. A book I wrote called Revelation Today. It's 100% free to you. You can download it at hopeawakens.org when you go to the Resources tab. Remember, hopeawakens.org. Org. Go to the Resources tab, download tonight's free gift book, Revelation Today, You Will Be Blessed. Remember at hopeawakens.org, you find those resources, previous presentations, and you can submit your questions. To ask your questions, as usual, my friend, Pastor Douglas Naa, of the, uh, the director of SALT. It is Written's Evangelism Training School. Doug, thanks for being here. Hey, John, it's good to be here. Always looking forward to our questions. I'm learning a lot. Uh, with these questions that are being asked and you also answering them. So here's our first one. Now in the book of Revelation chapter 13, it speaks of a symbolic beast that's lamb-like, but speaks like a dragon. And it has two horns. Now, John, what is the significance of these two horns? Now, it's, it's a little bit hard to directly understand that or answer that very directly because there's no place where it says the horns on the beast equal this. Now, horns in the Bible are said to, or it certainly seems, they represent strength. That's in prophecy. So it has been said that these horns represent the two strengths of the nation with the horns, and that would be the United States. It has been said that these would represent the twin freedoms, freedoms freedom of uh, government and freedom of religion, freedom of government and freedom of religion. I like that interpretation very much. That's what I would suggest. If someone were to die from suicide, will they not make it into heaven because of self-murder? Ooh, tough question. Yeah. Suicide's a really tough one. Okay, let me say this. Uh, let me say this. First, if you're battling suicidal thoughts, if you're battling a, a crippling depression, if you know somebody in, in that situation, please get help. See a professional, see a counselor, of course pray, but pray and then see somebody. And if you need to, please call the suicide prevention line, please. Uh, if you don't know what that, write that number down 
and keep it nearby and call it. There are people who want to help you. Now, suicide is not to be recommended, of course. It is self-murder. Murder is a transgression of the Ten Commandments, and so you'd think that that person might be lost. Samson took his own life. He did. Mm -hmm. uh, he's in the roll call of the faithful. What we know is that sometimes people are driven to suicide because of mental illness and serious chemical instability. And so in that case, it is my considered and studied opinion, you heard me say those words, I've not used those, I think, at all in Hope Awakens. You can expect God to look very mercifully upon that situation. No, we can't say that all suicides are lost. Certainly can't say they're all saved. And I believe there's, a, there's, there's room for an awful lot of hope given the circumstances in which some people take their lives. Don't lose hope. Don't judge people. Don't consign them to being lost. Remember that God is merciful. Just trust God with every case and know that God will do the very best thing every time. Revelation chapter 14, verse 11 reads, And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, these worshipers of the beast and its image, and whoever receives the mark of its name. Now, this seems like ongoing punishment and not annihilation. Can you explain that, please? Yeah, sure it does. But you've got to remember that the Bible uses uh, idioms and figures of speech that in English we might not use forever and ever or forever in, uh, in, in the Bible writings frequently is used in conjunction with an event that's already taken place. The punishment is forever. But if it's true that these people burn forever, then what do we make of the verses in the Bible that say that people would be turned to ashes? Even Satan will be turned to ashes in Revelation's lake of fire. It says that in Ezekiel chapter 28. Malachi chapter 4 infers that everyone who's lost will be turned to ashes. So yeah, sounds like it, but it isn't because we've learned to interpret the Bible according to ourself. Uh, sorry. We've learned to interpret the Bible according to itself and not according to the traditions that we were taught when we were children. Can you please explain Mark chapter 16, verse 18, which reads, They will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay, hand, lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. Yeah, I sure can. What it doesn't mean is that you should pass snakes around in church. It doesn't mean you should drink poison and be yeah. presumptuous. It doesn't mean that. What it does mean is that there'll be times when people like Paul, when he was uh, shipwrecked on the island of Malta, a serpent grabbed a hold of him. It was venomous. He shook it off. They expected him to die, but he didn't because God protected. So when you're living within the will of God, God is saying you can encounter these very deadly situations and be unharmed according to the will of God in every given situation. Don't be presumptuous. Don't put yourself in harm's way. God is not recommending that. Now, how long was Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden before they sinned? Do you know? What does the Bible say? I don't know. The Bible doesn't say we don't know. Not too long, but we don't know. This is Jesus in his resurrected state in Luke chapter 24, verse 39. He says, behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself, handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you uh, have seen me. Now, this seems to mean that spirits do not have flesh and bones, and it also implies that you could see the spirits. Yeah, now, Jesus was simply saying, I'm not an apparition. You know, when they were on the water and they saw Jesus coming towards him, it says they, they were worried it might have been a spirit. An apparition of some kind, not a disembodied person, not a soul, just an apparition. And Jesus was saying, it's really me. Come and touch me. I'm the real thing. Now, did you say that when a person who's been saved can lose their salvation? Yes, I did. I absolutely did. Because that's what the Bible makes clear. A person who comes to Jesus can turn away and make the decision to be lost. Some will say a saved person wouldn't make that decision. Of course a saved person might. Saved people do it all the time. King Saul was filled with the Holy Spirit, died a very lost man. Saved people can be lost. Just make, just make sure that you aren't lost. Hang on to Jesus. Don't let go. Don't walk away. Now, the Bible says that when Christ returns the dead and Christ shall rise and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up into the air. At that moment, Will the wicked remain sleeping in the graves or will they be resurrected to meet their judgment? Um, the lost 
who are in the grave when Jesus comes back, remain in the graves until the end of Revelation's 1,000 years. Then they're raised, a uh, lake of fire takes place. Now, John, this question says, I have been praying for the deliverance of my brother for 20 years, deliverance from mental issues, from drug abuse, and God has not answered my prayers. Is there something that I'm doing wrong? Am I not, am I not praying according to God's will? No, there's nothing you're doing wrong, nothing at all. You just keep praying. It's, it's, it's only been 20 years. Keep praying. Don't give up. John, what does, what does righteousness by faith mean? And whose righteousness is it? When, when Christ gives us his righteousness, how does God see us? Does he see Christ's righteousness or our righteousness? Well, he better not see our righteousness because we don't have any righteousness. God, when he sees the saved, sees us clothed in Christ's righteousness. The righteousness that we receive by faith is verily Jesus' righteousness. So you claim Jesus is your Lord and Savior. We must be righteous in order to be saved. We receive the righteousness of Jesus. So when God looks on us, He sees us clothed in Christ's righteousness. We have none of our own to recommend before God. Now, if I believe with all my heart that the Sabbath is from sunset Friday to sunset, uh, sunset Friday to sunset Saturday. But yet I still go to church on Sunday. But I believe with all my heart that the Sabbath is Saturday and my church is on Sunday. Will I still make it into heaven? I got, I got a question for that person. Let me, ask that, let me ask that question. Why would you do that? If you really believe a certain something, why would you not practice it? Well, there's a demonstration that you don't have faith in God because faith isn't what you believe in your head. It's what you believe in your head and then express in your life. So I'm not understanding your motivation. I, I can't answer the question because it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. If you really believe it, then you'll do it. If you don't do it, it's very evident that you don't really believe it. Only intellectually and that, eh, nothing. The Bible says even the devil believes or the devils believe and tremble. So right about now, um, I'm seeing a, a little parallel. Separate yourself from the pack and step out in faith. This question reads, Pastor John, Many years ago, when I was young, I had an abortion. Even though in my heart, I knew it was wrong. Through the pressure of the Father and being naive and afraid myself, I went along with it. I have asked God for forgiveness, and I know He has forgiven me. My question is, do aborted babies go to heaven, and will they grow there? That's a really good question. It is. We recently did programs about this on It Is Written. If you haven't seen that program, uh, uh, you ought to see it. Innocence Lost. Innocence Lost. See that. Um, here's what I want to say. First, you're right. God has forgiven you. And this is one of the things that we often forget as people argue about abortion. A lot of, a lot of people have had abortions and they feel badly about it. And sometimes condemnation makes them feel like they have no hope. Rightly, you understand that you do have hope God does forgive you. Abortion is wrong. It's a sin. Uh, it's the, it's the, the terminating of an innocent life. My goodness, if that child had been born a day, that would be murder. So we understand that you're forgiven. What happens to the aborted babies? Again, an aborted child has done nothing wrong, committed no sin, hasn't done anything that we would say, this child cannot go to heaven. Now, it would be wrong for me to say all aborted babies are saved. I have no authority to do that. The Bible doesn't even make that clear, except it does make clear that people who are lost are lost because they've rejected Christ or they've participated in sin and not repented. Here's what I want to encourage you to do. Be positive. It would seem to me that you'll see your child again. That's what it would seem to me. Again, I'm veering off the, here's what the Bible clearly says, but that's what it seems like. You should be hopeful. Thanks for your questions, Doug. I think we're going to have to... Those are that's good questions. Yeah, yeah, we'll settle it there. Thank you very, very much. We'll see you again with more questions tomorrow. We shall. But I have a special guest I want to introduce to you tonight, Dr. Michael Hazel, Professor of Near Eastern Studies at Southern Adventist University. Dr. Hazel is an author and international speaker, and he's an archaeologist. He spent many seasons digging in Israel, and he's dug elsewhere as well. Dr. Hazel is the director of Southern's Archaeological Institute, and he directs the Lynn H. Wood Archaeology Museum on the campus of Southern Adventist University, which is in Collegedale, Tennessee. Dr. Michael Hazel, thank you very much for joining me. It's great to be with you, John. How does archaeology help us, inform us, 
when it comes to understanding and interpreting the Bible? Well, it's able to inform us because the Bible is historically constituted, which means that the Bible was founded in a historical time and place. God, when he spoke this world into existence, established time, he established places, and he works in history, all through history among his people, which allows us, because the Bible is historically constituted, to go back to those places, to go back and investigate the people, the events that the Bible talks about. No other religious book out there of the major world religions gives us that kind of perspective of a God that works in history in such a tangible way. So give me a couple of examples then of how archaeology has settled some disputes or, or validated our faith in the Word of God. Well, there are several examples that one could give. Uh, for years ago, many years ago, the historians were doubting whether the Hittites existed. And the Hittites basically were not existent because they weren't uh, mentioned in any of the historical sources, in any of the Greek sources, any of those uh, places. And so what we have then, suddenly in 1906, the capital city of the Hittites is discovered in modern-day Turkey, the ancient site of Hattusha, and suddenly we have a whole language and a whole people that we now know existed in history. Not only did they exist, but they were the major power outside of Egypt, the major rival power with the greatest empire in existence at that time. So we have two major empires that were in existence, and the Hittites, of course, are mentioned many times in the Bible as well. That's one example. Another example is David. In more recent years, David's name was not known. It was, it was not known outside of the Bible, and some archaeologists, some historians doubted whether David actually existed. In 1993, that mystery was solved when this particular inscription was uncovered. This is not the one. This is a replica. But underneath this inscription, we read, uh, that uh, David, the house of David, is mentioned for the first time in history. And that means that we have conclusive evidence now, not only for the existence of David, but also for the existence of his kingdom 140 years after his time. Now, of course, archaeology can't find everything. But when you find that sort of thing, it's absolutely got to grow a person's faith in the Bible and, and validate, at least the way I see it, the Word of God. Now, take two minutes. Tell me one or two of the most fascinating things that you've ever encountered in your work as an archaeologist. Well, that's tough because I've been working in this field for 30 years. But uh, I can tell you this, there's nothing more exciting than being in the country of Israel or Jordan or Cyprus or Egypt or any of the land of the Bible. And, and pick up an artifact for the first time as you're excavating and be able to hold that artifact in your hand. I'm holding here in my hand a sling stone that uh, I discovered in the Valley of Elah. And this uh, sling stone could have easily been like a sling stone that David would have picked up. It's a smooth, natural stone. This was not carved. Uh, it was a sling stone like that that David picked up on his way to fight Goliath. And some years ago, I had the opportunity to excavate a site overlooking the Elah Valley where that famous battle took place between David and Goliath. And we have dated that site back to the time of Saul, to the time of David. And we are certain that that is one of the earliest Judean sites in existence today. That's just one example. Right across the border is the land of Philistia. And for several years, I worked among the Philistines at two major sites that are mentioned in the Bible. And what's interesting is at the Philistine sites, we have a number of important indicators. We have 30% of the bones that are discovered in Philistia are pig bones, but when we excavate across the border in a place like Kirbet Kayafa or in Azeka or in Sucho or other sites in Judah, no pig bones are found. And if they're found, they're exceedingly rare. And at our site, zero pig bones in seven years. So there is this ethnic indication of what people ate. You've heard the phrase, you are what you eat. Well, that's a very typical kind of thing that we see archeologically, scientifically, as we begin to excavate these sites in the Middle East. 
Dr. Hazel, this is just so fascinating. I really appreciate it. And I'm very grateful for the work that you do. It's faith building for the rest of us. And thank you so much for joining me tonight on Hope Awakens. Thanks. Thank you. Dr. Michael Hazel, uh, archaeologist, professor of Near Eastern Studies at Southern Adventist University. What a blessing to have him here. Okay, let's pray and we'll dive into the Bible tonight. Our Father in heaven, we come in the name of Jesus, thanking you, appealing to you that we would be led by your spirit. We're not asking you to send your spirit because of course you will. I'm asking you, Lord, to touch our hearts that we would be led. Guide us, please, for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Condé Nast magazine earlier this year listed the 10 safest countries in the world comes from information gathered by something called the Institute for Economics and Peace, which does an annual ranking of the world's safest countries. With help from something called the Economist, wait a moment, I don't think that's right, the Economist Intelligence Unit, it ranks 163 countries on, and I'm quoting now, a country's level of negative peace using three domains of peacefulness. I don't know what that is either, but I'm gonna tell you what the top 10 countries are. Number 10, safest country in the world, Czech Republic, which is a fabulous place. That's Prague you're looking at, and it's a stunning city. Number nine, Japan, the eighth safest country in the world, at least according to this survey, Slovenia. Then number seven is Singapore. Number six, oh, Canada. Number five, Denmark, fourth most safe country in the world, Austria. Number three, Portugal. Number two, beautiful New Zealand and the safest country in a, row, in, in a world, in, in the world for the 12th year in a row, Iceland. This is according to Condé Nast, borrowing data from various organizations. Singapore has been stated to be the world's safest city. Anyone who's been there would see why. Another city often mentioned right up near the top of the list, Tokyo, Japan. One of the biggest ideas in the history of psychology is Maslow's hierarchy or pyramid of needs. It was first introduced by Abraham Maslow in the United States in 1943, excuse me. A mainstay, it is a mainstay of psychological analyses. Abraham Maslow wanted to find out what made life really purposeful. And so he put together this hierarchy of needs. Now, first on the hierarchy is one's physiological needs then safety needs, then belonging and love needs, then esteem needs, and then at the top of the list, self-actualization. Now, needs lower down in the hierarchy have to be satisfied before needs higher up can be taken care of. So notice this, at the bottom, which is really at the top, those most pressing needs, those that undergird everything else, physiological. You gotta be able to eat, drink, be warm, get rest. And then after that, safety needs, security and safety. The way Maslow put it, you need to be safe before you can experience belonging and love, before you can have your esteem needs met, your social needs, your feelings of accomplishment, and before you can achieve self-actualization, achieving your full potential and thriving in creative activities. I don't want to analyze this too deeply. It's a theory, and I'm no psychologist. If you like Maslow, you love it. If you don't, you'd be a little critical. But I want to point something out. We all know that we have needs. The most basic needs are those related to our survival. You're not going to rate your need to pirouette in a tutu or your need to make a piece of pottery as more important than your need to eat or drink. But that second most fundamental need on the list is for safety. We can relate to that. You know that more than 38,000 people a year die in accidents on the road in the United States. In the United Kingdom, about 27,000 killed or seriously injured. The much lower number is those killed. Uh, in Australia, it's about 1,200 road deaths a year. Although in the 1970s, it was quite incredibly, about three times that, so these numbers can come down. Let's switch gears. Heart disease kills about 650,000 people a year in the United States, 170,000 a year in the United Kingdom, about 17,500 a year in Australia, about 50 a day. Okay, now think about the global pandemic right now. You know, we haven't seen people getting locked away or locked down 
or quarantined for mm, road accidents, even though there's a very good chance you might not make it home safely. There's a one in four chance in Western countries you're gonna die of heart disease, but we don't see people panicking or being very fearful about heart disease. See, the numbers by comparison, or should I say this? By comparison, the numbers with COVID-19 have been low. You're not gonna find 450,000 Americans die from COVID-19 in 12 months, we don't think. But here's the difference, right? You don't catch a car accident. You've got some degree of control over that. If you go about your life normally, you expect to be okay. You don't catch heart disease. No one worries that you catch heart disease at a playground or end up having a heart attack because someone coughed in your presence. No one wears a mask because of heart disease. The nature of the pandemic has caused fear. People worried about going to work, worried about touching doorknobs, worried about whether or not the person near them was carrying something that they could pass on. It's very hard to feel safe when you just don't know if you might pick up a sickness, when you don't know if you're coming in contact with a bug. You've had the same experience as me. Walking down a sidewalk, the person walking towards you takes a wide berth because no one's taken any chances. Those pictures that show how far a sneeze can travel, isn't that gross? A lot of people have felt panic-stricken because of the unknown. Why? Because it is hardwired into us to want to be safe. That's why we lock our houses. It's why we lock our cars. And it's an indictment on us as a society that safety is such an issue. Women jogging, well, you'll often see a female jogger carrying pepper spray or mace, and it's not the bears they're worried about. It's sad, I mean, it's pitiful. Domestic violence is a terrible issue. The vast majority of that is perpetrated against women who should not have to live with that sort of fear, with that sort of concern for their safety. Something is terribly wrong when a person can't feel safe in her own family. Children, children so often don't feel safe at home. And whereas when I was at a child, I'd tell my mother I was going off to spend the day with whoever it was. Remember what that was like? Mom, I'm off to Joey's house, be back later. No one was the least bit worried. Of course, it's just not like that anymore. That's a huge shame. When safety goes, innocence goes. Joy often goes. Before 9-11, security at airports was, well, you know what, in all honesty, I don't really remember what it was like. But we know what it's like now. We know there's a great lack of safety and we've reacted against that. It's brought an enormous financial cost, a truly massive social cost. When you can't be sure you're safe, then you're far less likely to trust. So we wanna know we're safe from illnesses. In some parts of the world, people are just starting to wake up from the coronavirus. Societies are starting to lurch back into life. But looking into the future, no one can predict what's gonna happen. Will it come again? Should we gather in large groups? When will it be safe to fly again? Let's think of another aspect of safety though. It's as important as anything I've mentioned, it might be more important. What about spiritual safety? Now, we have these assurances, look at them. The Bible says in 1 John 4, verse eight, and we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Jesus made this wonderful invitation. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus said of or or to his people in Matthew 23, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. What was Jesus saying? He was saying, I wanted to keep you safe. I wanted to shelter you. I wanted to protect you. And now this promise, it's fantastic. Proverbs 18, verse 10, it says, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and is safe. See what God wants for you? Wants you to be safe, to be secure, to know that you have a place of safety in his heart. 
Jeremiah wrote that the Lord has appeared of old to me saying, yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. Now that's safety. But speaking of spiritual safety, what about when it comes to the church? The church really should be a place of spiritual safety. Unfortunately, it doesn't always look like that or work out like that. We know that churches can be a place of spiritual abuse. We know that. And I'm not referring to some of the criminal things that have happened in churches. And I don't have any burden here to be critical of churches that have sponsored that because sadly, sinful acts like that have happened in every church, every denomination. No church is without excuse. That's because churches are made up of people and people are inherently faulty. There's always going to be someone who takes their eyes off Jesus and gets overtaken by sin themselves and then causes harm to others. It's tragic. If you've been through any type of mistreatment at the hands of a church or people at church, then you'll know how it can be devastating, difficult. It can be spiritually ruinous. Can I encourage you? I want to encourage you to keep your eyes on Jesus. Know that people are going to let you down. Some people will do terrible things. It's very important to be forgiving. Forgiveness helps you more than the person you forgive. And I'm not saying that people should be let off the hook or they shouldn't face the consequences of their actions. But don't judge the entire church by the actions of a few or even of the many. I was told by one kind woman that when she and her husband became Christians, they started attending a, a church, a congregation. She told me they didn't accept us. They wouldn't include us. They hated us. I said, so what'd you do? She told me the most remarkable thing. They stayed. They hung around. And over the years, and it was years, those walls of resistance started coming down. And then they were accepted and went right along. Another man told me, he said, when I started attending this certain church, nobody liked me. So I decided I would make them like me. And he did, and they did. And the story had a happy ending. But not many people are able to weather a storm like that. Well, I know that someone's thinking, but who says you need to go to a church anyway? Well, very evidently, God does. Hebrews chapter 10, starting in verse 24 and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. And it seems from the context that the writer is referring to the second coming of Jesus as that day. Yes, you should be part of a church to receive and bless and be a blessing to others. We come together in church as family, brothers and sisters in Christ. It's important to worship together and beyond that, to plan together, to work together for the salvation of others. That's very important. I don't know of many armies who fight their battles without the soldiers ever coming together for training, for organization, to help each other, to plan. If you can be there, if you can be there, you ought to be in church. The church is a lighthouse and that light burns a little less bright when you're not there. When someone feels no need to be in church, it's evident that that person doesn't understand the mission of the church. And remember that Jesus was very clear in Matthew 16. He said, and I say also unto you that you are Peter and upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, Jesus was clear. I have a church. Now, the word that Jesus used there translates, uh, which translates to Peter, is the Greek word petros, and it means a stone. Now, it could mean a rock, but not a real big rock. It might mean a rock like something you might dig out of your lawn so the mower doesn't tangle with it. But when Jesus said, upon this rock, he used the Greek word petra, which means rock, a mass of rock. There's a reason that the ancient city in Jordan is called Petra, and that's because it's carved out of rock, a lot of rock. Jesus told Peter he would establish a church 
on this rock, I will build my church. Of course, Peter wasn't that rock. In fact, the claim that the church was built on Peter wasn't even made for another 400 years after Jesus said that. And it's well known that when an important church council was held, the Jerusalem council in Acts 15, the chair of that meeting, the spokesperson was James, not Peter. The church wasn't built upon Peter. The rock upon which the church is founded is Jesus. Upon this rock, Jesus was saying, I will establish the church upon myself. That's why the Bible says in the Psalms, Oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. It says, The Lord liveth, and blessed be my rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. Jesus is referred to as the chief cornerstone. And if you've ever seen the size of the stones that were used in the making of the temple or the temple mount, you'll know that this is referring to Jesus as a bigger rock than Peter could ever have hoped to be. The idea of church is very biblical. The church was established by Jesus. Jesus said he'd have a church. Paul greeted the church in Caesarea. You read that in Acts. The Bible also says in Acts, and from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. He called for them church leaders in Ephesus. He wrote of the church was, which is at Sancria in Romans 16. He wrote to the church of God at Corinth. You get the picture. It's all through the New Testament. It's biblical to be part of the church. No question. But of course, that begs another question. Which one? So what do you think the tendency is? The tendency is, of course, to be part of the church you were raised in, if you were raised attending a church. So your parents believe this, your grandparents, and way on back, and that's not altogether bad. Tradition is good. Family loyalty is good. Of course, though, what is good when it comes to church? And if you weren't raised in a church, you might attend the church someone invited you to. Never forget a man who told me, you know, I just realized why I attend the church I attend. He told me he'd been in the military. A friend shared his faith with him. He chose Jesus when he got out in the military. He went back home, joined his friend's church. He said he never really thought about why at the time. It's just what he did. And so what you learn, you accept as being right, right? It's like the values you pick up from your parents. You have good table manners. You don't have good table manners. More than likely, it's what you grew up with. You never gave it another thought. Grow up in a home where there's racism. You probably got a surprise that day that you learned racism isn't acceptable. You grow up eating certain foods. Ah, like these. Mmm. You grow up loving that. Well, you grow up loving that. Wheat bix Marmite? If you, well, if you don't, well, you know, the thing is, something like Marmite, if you grow up loving it, it's a South Pacific thing, other people who didn't wonder how you can eat it. I know. You grow up in a home where people squeeze the toothpaste tube from wherever, you think that's okay. Why do you think it's any different when it comes to spiritual things? People believe what they believe based on a lot of external factors, how they were raised, values they've picked up along the way, your culture, your friend group. But where should your spiritual values come from? Of course, they should come from the Bible. In fact, the Bible itself describes the church like this, 1 Timothy 3. But if I'm delayed, Paul wrote, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. See that? According to the Bible, the church is the pillar and the ground of the truth. But again, and I'm, I'm wanting to level with you here. We likely both know people who go to church where they go because of the style of music, nothing to do with Bible teaching, or because the church got a well-known preacher, nothing to do with Bible teaching. Some people worship where they worship because the church is easy to get to. I understand all that, but when you're talking about something as utterly important as how you experience your relationship with God, how you interpret the Bible Man, you got to look at it right. you got to base all of that on the Bible, on what the Bible says. And don't think it doesn't matter. You attend a church where the accepted standard is that the dead aren't dead but can appear to you after they depart. You've opened yourself up to major deceptions. Set yourself up to be swept away in earth's last days by false miracles. You've chosen a path against the Bible. 
You don't want to believe in a secret rapture that will never happen or that God is in reality a tyrant who will burn people forever and ever. That idea makes atheists out of people, drives people away from God altogether. So you see, it matters what you believe. It's virtually impossible not to be influenced by false teachings. If your fellowship and worship with the Bible isn't the authority, the results can be devastating. As you look ahead, it seems impossible to imagine that God's people are going to enter into a time of trouble such as never was and be all over the page in what they believe. It's impossible to imagine that. Exactly what that's going to be like now, looking ahead, we don't know. But we can know that before Jesus returns, God's people will be leaning on Him and leaning on the Bible like never before. And you don't want to lean on a house of cards. You want to have a solid foundation. You don't want to have misconceptions. You don't want to believe untruths. You know what it's like to have people believe things about you that aren't true. So think with me about what Jesus said, John 10. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring. And they shall hear my voice and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Look at what God says about his people when Jesus comes back. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Now we look in Revelation 12. It's the story of the church, God's church, down through the ages. Revelation 12, 1. Now a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet. On her head, a garland of 12 stars. In prophecy, a woman is a symbol that represents a church. Pure woman in Revelation 12 impure woman, impure church, Revelation 17. Now, a couple of verses later in Revelation 12, we see the fall of Satan, who drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them down to the earth, deceived the angels. It says that the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. The devil seeking to destroy Jesus. Verse 6 says, Then the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. The 1,260 years when the Bible was trampled on, when a fallen church was in charge, when it was difficult to access truth, when people died for their faith in large numbers, when the true church was persecuted. The chapter then recaps the fall of Satan, his eviction from heaven. Then verse 12 says, Rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows he has a short time, which reiterates this spiritual battle we're in is not a game. If you've not been taking your faith seriously, you know you really need to. If it seems like life is kicking you around, it might just be that you've never really placed yourself in the arms of God. You've never read your Bible like you were serious about it. You've never recognized this life and death battle we're in. In this chapter that looks at a unique way in the history of the church, of God's followers, ends by saying, And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. That verse shows us more than one thing. We're in a spiritual battle. Ask yourself, if soldiers in the military approach battles in the same way you're approaching the spiritual battle you're in, What chance would they have? This is very real. The verse shows us how God's people live in earth's last days. Did you notice that? They keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Don't miss this. This description in Revelation 12, look at it. The dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God. Notice, a remnant. Now that's a part that remains usually at the end of something. It isn't the whole It's smaller. At the end of time, God's people are described as a remnant. It's that group that remains and is true to God in the end. Man, it's good news. The Bible says God will have a remnant in the close of time, a people who will remain. In the close of time, when the world follows the beast, there'll be a people that remains. When the world goes in many different directions, there's a people that remain. They're staying true to the word of God. And how are they described? The remnant keep the commandments of God. Obeying God is the natural response of having been saved by His grace as Jesus lives in you. 
It's a surrender to the indwelling presence of Jesus. So it's clear God will have a people before Jesus comes back, keeping the commandments of God. You know, it's a funny old world we live in when you've, you've got people who will argue about whether or not we ought to obey God. Some people won't let their children argue about their commandments. Same people believe in obeying the speed limit, but they will question the necessity of obeying God. Not sure we need to obey God. So let me put it to you in this fashion. When Jesus enters your life, He leads you in paths of right. He changes your heart. He makes you new, guides you in His footsteps. In fact, Paul wrote that it is God who works in you both to will and to do for His good pleasure. Philippians 2.13. God has your life. You give Him the steering wheel. You follow where He leads you. And God is going to lead you in obedience. He will do that in your life. And where it says God's people keep the commandments of God, how many do you think they obey? There are 10 of them. So God's people would be willing to follow, of course, all 10. And if, like me, you had a realization one day that, whoa, I, I'm not keeping one of them, not even trying, you look at why that's the case. For me, it clearly wasn't that the Bible taught me I should obey only nine commandments. It was that my family did it in a certain way. My friends did it in a certain way. My church taught a certain way. I knew I could either follow them or follow Jesus. I decided that the Bible would be the most important thing and I'd follow Jesus. What would you do? What would God's remnant teach in the latter days of earth's history? You know, I've been asked many times why Martin Luther didn't keep all of the Ten Commandments, why he never taught others to do so. Well, that's because knowledge is progressive. It's a bit like asking why Albert Einstein didn't invent the iPhone. Luther had come out of immense spiritual darkness and he advanced according as God led him. And now it's our turn to do what Thomas Edison did, for example, stand on the shoulders of those who came before us and gather what they've learned. That's what Edison did. Edison improved earlier versions of the light bulb. There'd be no LED bulbs today without what Edison did back then. Edison grew in his understanding, stood on the shoulders of others. We do the same. We read the messages of the three angels as found in Revelation chapter 14, and we realize some things. We're living in the judgment time. We choose not to receive the mark of the authority of the beast. God is calling us out of spiritual confusion. He's calling us to keep all of his commandments. God is calling us to embrace the everlasting gospel, remembering that the gospel is the story of how people are saved by God's grace through faith in the blood Jesus shed when he died on the cross. Revelation 12, 17, again, we'll see something important. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Let's pause right there. What have we discovered about the remnant so far? They keep the commandments of God, teach and believe the everlasting gospel, don't receive the mark of the beast. Okay, we've gone through that. And now the remnant have the testimony of Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Revelation 19.10 that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. That's the same as saying the gift of prophecy. Now, Nostradamus, Gene Dixon, no, not prophets, nothing given them by God there. God has said, though, that the gift of prophecy is important. How do you find out when it's real? How do you find it when it's real? 1 Corinthians 12, God has appointed these in the church. First apostles, secondarily prophets, and so on. Did you notice it's found in the church? God says he sets it up in the church just as he gives other gifts, he gives the gift of prophecy. Jesus warned us to watch for false prophets. So you, if you're watching for false prophets, you've got to know that the genuine gift of prophecy would exist. Notice what this verse says, to the law and to the testimony. If they do not speak according to this word, it's because there's no light in them. Now we know it's fashionable today for people to talk about Jesus in one breath and the next say, we don't obey the law of God. If I went downtown and said people could drive as fast as they want, break any law they want, no one would believe me, but I stand up in church and say God's law doesn't matter, someone's going to call me anointed. God raised up this spiritual gift for a special reason. 
to prepare his people for something great. Noah was given the gift of prophecy so he could tell people the flood was coming. John the Baptist, so he could prepare people for Jesus. It makes sense for the gift of prophecy to show up to prepare people for the second coming of Jesus, to call people to the word of God, to encourage them to surrender. Amos 3, 7. Surely the Lord would do nothing except he reveals his secrets to his servants, the prophets. And God said his remnant in the last days would see this gift in action. They'd see the gift of prophecy in their midst. How did God place this gift in the remnant that keep his commandments? In the 19th century, when people all around the world were starting to think and teach and preach about the return of Jesus Christ, God called a 19-year young woman and blessed her with a special endowment of the Holy Spirit. She shared it with others for over 70 years. Today, there are more than 100 books in her name available in the English language. In fact, she's the most translated female author in the history of modern literature. What she shared with others about Jesus and His Word has changed lives around the world. The church she helped to found is in more countries than any other Protestant church on the planet. Her book, Steps to Christ, is the best I know of outside the Bible on the subject of successful Christian living. She wrote about the life of Christ, the parables of Christ, and on many other topics so people could grow in their faith. The ministry of healing, which deals with being physically and spiritually healthy has been praised as being a hundred years ahead of its time. And although she never graduated high school, although she never even graduated elementary or primary school, distinguished medical experts have spoken highly of her insights. Clive Mackay, former professor of Cornell University said, whatever may be the religious belief of a reader, he or she cannot help but gain much guidance in a better and healthier way of life from reading the major works of Ellen White. Every modern specialist in nutrition whose life is dedicated to human welfare must be impressed by the writings and leadership of Ellen White. Her ministry has helped thousands of people begin a relationship with Jesus and grow their faith in the Bible. That's what the gift of prophecy is supposed to do. Does it take the place of the Bible? No. Does it make the Bible less important? What would you think after this many presentations in Hope Awakens? No. Is it like having another Bible? No. She was very clear that her role was to point people to the Bible. People familiar with what she wrote, or let me say it this way, if you become familiar with what she wrote, you'll be blessed. Let me encourage you, don't just take my word for it. Grab something she's written and read it and see that you'll be blessed. So here's what we see characterizes God's remnant in the last days. This group of people following Jesus according to the Bible. The remnant will keep the commandments of God, believe the gospel, share the everlasting gospel globally, and have the gift of prophecy. Now look at Revelation 18, starting in verse 1. After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority. The earth was illuminated with his glory. And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit and a cage for every unclean and hateful bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. The merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. Very straight message. God's speaking to people who haven't yet made the decision to surrender to him. And notice what he says. I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins and receive her plagues. There's a call out of false worship, out of Babylon. It's important. God says, come out of her, my people. So God is looking to the world, maybe to you, and he's saying, I love you. I've got a plan for you. I have a place of safety for you. A place of safety, not because all the people are so good they never make mistakes, not because all the leaders only make perfect decisions, but because the message of the Bible is clear and true. The teachings of the Bible are solid. They represent Jesus and will guide you in his way. God says, come out of Babylon. He says, be part of the remnant, keeping the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. He called me to do that once. I'm glad he did. As we consider all of these points we've looked at, we can see there's only one church in the world who meets all of them. And of course, someone's going to say, okay, John, are you saying... Anyone not in your church is lost? You know me well enough by now to know that I'm not saying that. 
But here's what I'm saying as clearly and as prayerfully as I can. Jesus is calling you to surrender to him fully. He wants you to be part of the church that's teaching the closest to the Bible that you can find. The Seventh-day Adventist church is a community of faith that is holding to the Bible. While the world is going in one direction and much of Christianity in yet another direction, God has a body that is holding to the Bible and is standing on that word. No, that isn't to say there aren't other believers uh, who, uh, (coughs) excuse me, I've got something right about here. That is not to say that other believers cannot go to heaven when Jesus comes back. But God is calling them too. He's saying, honor me, grow in your faith. Don't let your traditions come between me and you. Don't follow teachings that aren't true. You're grateful for those who came before you and grew in the light of God's word. Luther and Knox and Calvin and others, if they hadn't, we'd be centuries behind where we are today. God wants you to do what they did, to stand up, to step forward, to follow Jesus' leading, to allow Jesus to remake you and fill you with blessing. You want peace in your heart? It comes from knowing that you and Jesus are on the same wavelength. No peace when you're not fully surrendered. You want to face the future with confidence, knowing Jesus is truly the center of your life, knowing you haven't held anything back from him. Jesus is coming back soon. What if you almost surrendered? Notice I've never said, what if you're almost good enough? Because that doesn't come into this. Accept Jesus, he'll give you all the goodness you need. He'll remake you. Other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I shall bring or must bring. And they shall hear my voice and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. John 10 and verse 16. God is leading in your life more than you can know. He wants you to spend eternity with him. And I want you to give, I want to give you the opportunity tonight. I want to give you the opportunity tonight to make a decision now so that you can be in God's remnant now And when Jesus returns, send me a text message. Would you hear this? Here's the number. 423-264-2575. And text me the word joy. Don't put it on Facebook. Don't phone me. Text me. 423-264-2575. Send me the word joy. I'll text you a link. Click that link and it'll ask you a series of questions or statements. Number one, I choose to follow the teachings of Jesus as found in the Bible. And you're going to say yes. Out of love for Jesus, I choose to keep all of his commandments, including the seventh day Sabbath. Of course, you'd say yes. Number three, I want to follow Jesus in baptism or rebaptism. Do what God is leading you to do. I desire to be part of the church that worships Jesus in spirit and in truth. That is the seventh day Adventist church. Say to the Lord, I want to be in the remnant. I have questions I'd like to discuss. And then how may we pray for you? Text joy to 423-264-2575. I am praying for you. Click the link, follow the list, and would you make a decision for Jesus tonight? I'll be praying for you tonight, and I'll see you tomorrow night for more of Hope Awakens. Hope Awakens.